much for chatting with me. It is, it is a joy. Mr. Malcolm's List is, I, it's a pleasure. It is just a pleasure to watch. Um, it really is just a wonderful film. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to chat with me. I appreciate it. No, thank you. I am glad you enjoyed it. I did. I did. I'm a sucker for these sorts of things, though. I, I truly am. Me uh, too. <laughs> Well, what, what excited you about the film? When what, what was it that got you fired up? Um, well, I think, you know, if you could go back as uh, since I was a kid, like I've always loved, you know, um, period dramas, period comedies, anything period. I, um, I've been a huge uh, fan of the British drama, basically, since you can imagine. And also, uh, British comedy, you know, like I grew up on, you know, the Richard Curtis movies of the 90s and, and things like that. So I was very much as a filmmaker missing that sort of tone and that sort of feeling. And I think when you're a first time filmmaker and, you know, this has been a 15 you know, year um, journey for me just as a director and figuring out, you know, when I left school that I you know, wanted to direct, I think um it, it's a very big uphill battle being you know uh, trying to make it in the industry and at a certain point I just went I want to I'm going to stop trying to be cool and do the things that I loved you know and that's sort of around the time that I you know found the Miss Mouth this script and I just felt like it it was a nod to all those things that I had loved growing up and I hadn't seen or read in a very very long time yeah, there, there's a real joy to the film, and, and it's almost Austin-esque and, and funny. There's, it's just wonderful. Um, it's, real, it's real fan fiction, you know, and I think Suzanne, the writer of the original novel, would say that too, you know? Like, I, I, I keep saying to people, it is fantasy, you know? It's not, it's, it, it's not really based on truth, and, uh, uh, you know, it is complete fiction and complete fan fiction. And I think, you know, that sort of approach was how everybody who worked on the movie sort of took, you know, the rules of the world we were building, you know? Um, the, the truth of the matter is most period dramas are fantasy, you know? We don't have, they don't need to be historically accurate. We don't know if they're historically accurate, you know? Um, and if it was, I think, uh, you know, most of my cast would have to have no teeth because fluoride didn't exist. So, you know, I think it, it, it is definitely um, a, a wonderful uh, n novel, which I think Suzanne would say is complete Jane Austen fan fiction as well. Well, you know, it's funny. It's funny you say that about it being fantasy because this this era is sort of it's sort of back. But in a new way, I mean, we see things like Bridgerton and of course, well, Downton Abbey has been for a decade, but still, still extremely popular. What is it about this era? I mean, uh, you talk about British, British fan fiction, British stories. What is it about this era? For me personally, I think it just happened to be the piece of material I found. I think obviously like Downton Abbey is a hundred years later, um, you know, and even I'm a big fan of, you know, things like the, all the Tudor stuff they made, like the Spanish princess. And I just started watching Becoming Elizabeth this week. So for me, obviously it spans a huge thing. I think for us, it's just, it's pure coincidence that Bridgerton and Malcolm's List are set in the same 10 years. Um, and everybody's always, you know, obviously compares the two a lot, which really doesn't bother me. But I'm like, I personally feel the only real similarity is just, you know, the the actual time. But um, I think, I think, you know, a lot of, uh, and it wasn't Bridgerton and it wasn't Malcolm's List. A lot of people started to approach this genre in a different way before us. You know, Amara Sante made Belle. Um, you know, and uh, she made David Copperfield and Lynn Manuel made Hamilton. And I think Hamilton for me was the thing that I, w I was very lucky to see it in New York. And I came out of that. And I remember thinking as somebody who was, you know, a privileged, well-educated person, that maybe everything I had been taught in school wasn't necessarily always correct or always right maybe every film I've ever seen has painted the world to look a certain way and maybe it wasn't that way and um, and it just 
his bold decision to make Hamilton the way he did made me question everything I had seen or been taught. And I think the biggest question I had to ask myself right at the beginning of this process was, when did I actually think that England started to become the melting pot of culture it is today? And I realized I have never been taught that. I've never been given a visual to that. And actually with a, not much research, to be honest, just even, you know, a little Google, you can start to realize that England was a lot more diverse than any Hollywood TV show or film has ever portrayed it to be. And that was sort of where this all bore from me. And I just went, as soon as I had, you know, that thought process and sort of went down that rabbit hole, there was no other way um, I wanted to make this film. And I also thought like, you know, just on a surface level, like, you know, people of colour even rarely have rom-coms, take the period out of it for a second, you know? And even when I realised that when making the film, it just, it just, it fueled not just me, but everybody involved with the movie um, to keep the cast from the short film in the feature, to, to allow the cast to develop the film with me um, because for all of us, I think it just became about something so much more inclusive and so much more passionate than any of us had realized. Yeah, yeah, it works so well. And and certainly, you know, we were talking before about Bridgerton. It's a very, very different type of film. Like you said, the era is the connector. Uh, mm. and, but it, it is, it's, it's just such a wonderful story. It's, it's sweeping, it's romantic, it's funny. Um, I have to ask you about the list. Um, yeah, because I, I find it so interesting. I feel like, you know, as I was watching the film, I I just wondered what your opinion of the list was. Because on the one hand, the film doesn't judge it, and on the other hand, it it absolutely does. And and there's this mm -hmm. really interesting tension uh, about his list. I think so this is going to sound super cheesy, but maybe after ten minutes, you can probably see him a big cheese ball. Um, so when I read the script originally. I flash back to a certain episode of Friends where Ross writes a list about Rachel and she gets upset. Yeah. I grew up, I'm, I'm a Friends 90s bit, you know, teenager. So I was like, wait, that was where my head went initially. So I think my approach to it was always, we all have a list. Mm. I think the period of our, period language of Malcolm's list can make it seem a bit pompous. But for the time, I'm sure it was, you know, it, 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 it was pretty strict society, obvious nonsense. But um, for me and Shoppe specifically, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, what that list represented for Malcolm. And I think, you know, the, the Lady Kilbourne, his mother in the film, like she describes it so wonderfully. And, you know, it is that he, he uses the list as a shield. He's a second son. He actually, and as we know, like this is an era of arranged marriages and, you know, advantage, you know, marriages for wealth, marriages for status. The idea of true love and love was a, it was a, was a luxury. Um, and he is basically a big softy who was looking, you know, for real love and not to be sort of, uh, used uh, in any way, um, but no, and we, we, I think all elements of uh, the sort of dating elements of the film, we would all, me and the cast on set and in, in the development stages, we'd always try and talk about it in the modern parallel. So even when we were making the short film and we were doing the scene in the opera with Julia and um, Malcolm, I was like, it's kind of like swiping right or left on Tinder, you know? <laughs> That's exactly it, yes. So I was like, he, you know, it's just, it's, and I think it was important for us all to sort of connect to those modern parallels to really allow the cast to sink into the, um, sink into these characters. And, you know, I've always said each individual audience member, I hope roots for someone, I don't mind who, but I was always like, I, I want people to be torn on if they're team Julia or team Malcolm or team Selena. I just wanted to give the cast the most sort of, rounded approach to their characters that you know wow. that I could and the caricature for example which is actually right behind my head there but I couldn't fit it in my zoom frame um 
the uh, caricature, you know, me and Zowie were saying, it's like waking up one morning and seeing the most embarrassing picture of you on the front of the Daily Mail, you know? It's like waking up and someone's made the most embarrassing, horrific Twitter meme of you, you know? It's public humiliation. And I've always said Julia's scheme is, is about, for the good of womankind and the good of her reputation, less about Malcolm, you know? Um, but no, I think I think that was very key for all of us was to try and make something that young people could still relate to today um, emotionally. I, I had that same thought. All I was thinking was, is, oh, I yearn for the days when a trip to the opera uh, <laughs> is, is so scandalous. It's I just took her to the opera and it's like, but you, know. you know what you did? I'm like, ah, uh, anyway. Um, I know. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's, even some of it is quite hard to wrap your head around, but you know, then we sort of broke rules as well. Like, you know, I really, I had this idea for a horse auction scene and um, I really wanted to, from obviously the, the script is, uh, the script and the, the eventual film is quite different from the book. And, you know, Suzanne was really amazing at letting me sort of really run with it. And I really, one of the big things I wanted to do was visually like completely get everybody out of just constantly sitting around having cups of tea. I couldn't do it. I was like, I need to get more sort of activities and um, different textures and sets and uh, something a little bit more rustic um, was massively where my head was going with it. So everything from like the croquet and the horse auction scene and all that stuff was all sort of created in the development process. But I remember the production designer and the historical consultant being like, you know, women weren't allowed at horse auctions. And I was like, well, in my world, they are, you know? And I think, you know, it was, it was about, everything was always about creating our own rules within the world we were building together. Um, so I think that sort of plays into also allowing some of the emotional elements for the characters to feel more modern, you know? And then me just constantly trying to, you know, make sure that the language sounded proper, <laughs> so. Uh, absolutely. And I, I know we're, we're starting to run out of time, but just one more question for you. Mm. Um, one of the things I love about the film is it's, it uses the imagery of the mask, uh, quite literally at one point mm -hmm. in, in a masquerade ball. I was just wondering for you in, in relationships, how do, you, how do you, you see us seeing beyond the masks we wear? Um, I think it all really, I think, I think most people, and I literally just got married two weeks ago. So that's where my head is going when you ask that question. Yeah. So I know it takes me back to writing my vows. And I think, you know, to let yourself go with someone and truly be yourself and truly be honest. I have, I, as I said, on my wedding day, I think that's actually you know for me it's one of the things that has brought me more peace and more happiness so what enabled me to put my mask down with my now husband I think kindness I think trust and I think you know treating people with respect and kindness and I think you know a big part of Malcolm's journey is also learning you know that his situation and his position in the world is a lot easier than Selena and Julia's. And I think a lot, it, you know, the world would be a much better place if more men put more women on an equal pedestal with them. And that's one of the things that allowed my mask to come down with my now husband. And I think it's one of the things that allows Selena to fall in love with Malcolm is when he finally starts to show you know, that sensitive side to himself, that he is a real human being, that he isn't just checking things off a list, you know, metaphorically. Um, does that sort of answer the question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> no, that was wonderful, Emma. I really appreciate it. And the film is, the fil film is just pure joy. Uh, oh, thank you. That's what everyone, everyone says to me, they're like, what do you want people to really feel with this? And I'm like, just joy. I mean, like, I think when you go into something with that as an aim, like it allows everybody around you to through the process. And, matter, and by the way, we shot the movie in level five lockdown. So there was not a much joy in the world at the time while we were doing it. 
Um, so what going to set every day and being, being made to laugh, you know, the comedy making me laugh from Divian or Ollie or Zowie, like it was, it was a joyful experience. So that's all I can ask. Well, it, it comes across on screen. I, I really appreciate the time and I, I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you very much. Uh, have a lovely rest of, well, have a lovely weekend. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.